One, go. Hello, I'm Ingo, and this is um, just a small part of, of, of a wall panel um, we used here. As you can see, it's LVL. Um, we're not going to use the SGA timber, the, the solid pine, which is not good enough. If this is straight, true, and it's right. <coughs> the entire exterior is plied on the outside for obviously for bracing. But we are not stopping where the windows are. We have bracing or the plywood pretty much everywhere throughout the exterior wall. Um, even though it's not recognized as bracing as such, uh, because we still stick with the 3604. But um, it supersedes the requirements as well. Um, we do use the New Zealand wool insulation. Um, it definitely benefits our product in regards to the moisture control. Um, wool as such can take up to 10% of its own weight and doesn't lose the R value, which is very important. We have a climber membrane on the inside for air tightness and for moisture control. A diffusion open membrane on the outside, um, which then actually makes that panel uh, energy wow. efficient. The panel size can go up to 12 meters, so we are not talking about short panels. Um, pretty much the longest panel we have in here, let me just guess, I think it's on the outside, which is a 10 meter long one over there. So we do need the crane to crane it in. Yes, there is another expense. However, um, when it comes to air tightness, and you want less penetration, um, we try to keep these walls as long as we can. And obviously, uh, it doesn't matter for the crane whether we have it lifts up a 12 meter wall or a 4 meter wall. So, the longer the walls, the more efficient we can build this. Um, the entire process of actually finishing with the crane, um, I think the last panel is that one we put on, on the roof. It took us two days. And then the crane was gone and we can actually do our finishing work as in taping off all the, the joints of the, the wraps, screw everything off, make it ready for the engineer to inspect, um, which is very important. Engineers a big important part when it comes to these panels. Um, and basically we can do any design. We are not restricted to a model. Any design can be prefabbed and can come to the standard. And another benefit of this kind of wall structure is it does meet passive house criteria when it comes to a certified uh, passive house from here up to Wellington. So nothing needs to be done uh, in regards to that. Um, I'm not sure whether there are any more questions from your side. Just cool. Quite Thanks, Ingo. Is that it? Great. Thanks. Um, it's really, really good to have uh, Ingo and his team put this house together. It's, um, we call them the Germans. <laughs> so we're learning how to build better in New Zealand, and uh, it's kind of long overdue. So you've done a great job. Thank you very much, Ingo. You're welcome. So um, <coughs> just. To finish off this this panel here, the key thing about it is the, the really the air tightness in the membranes. So the air tightness means, like Ingo said, this is an energy efficient wall. So if we're not leaking air, we've got less heating requirement. But also because of the fact that it's a vapor control membrane on both sides, we're not allowing moisture to get into the wall, which in New Zealand homes can be a problem, um, and we can actually get mould growing in the walls in relatively new houses. So, which is a bad thing, it's a health issue. So, <coughs> um, the thing about an uh, airtight house is you've got to have a ventilation system. So in this house here, we've got a ventilation system which um, is continually changing the air, taking the stale air out and delivering fresh air. So, can anyone see where that ventilation is coming in in this house? It's a trick question, it's hidden. So we've got no roof cavity, so this is our roof um, construction here, so there's no attic space 
or, or um, cavity space in the roof. So uh, instead of having the ventilation going through the roof, we've got a concrete duct going through the floor and fresh air comes out underneath this island bench here. And um, there's a um, heat recovery ventilation unit sitting in the laundry and the, above the ceiling. So having the services cavity is really good. So in this house we've got flat rectangular air ducts which are hidden in that wall services cavity on the inside. So um, as well as having our electrical and plumbing in there so we're not penetrating the air tightness of the wall. Um, so yeah, and we're basically we're taking stale moist air from the um, bathrooms and um, laundry and toilet and um, delivering fresh air to the bedrooms and the um, living space. <coughs> so we've got a really good quality of air and we're extracting any of the nasty um, gassing off from materials and things which um, uh, yeah, in this house we've got less of that anyway because we're using good um, environmentally sound certified materials wherever possible. But you know, if you go into a new house and you have that new house smell, that's not good a lot of the time. Because um, if you can smell that, then the air quality is not very good for humans. So, um, really nice high quality air. And that's something that's not really considered in the New Zealand code. Actually, air tightness isn't isn't part of the New Zealand building code either. There's no standard at all for air tightness, whereas overseas um, there is a standard for, the, for that. So the other um, clever tricky thing is this. So we've got a um, downdraft, um, so that sucks out the um, cooking vapours and um, so it's not connected up yet, but there's a fan on on the other side of this wall. There's a fan unit which the duct will be connected down to here, going through the floor, and that just means that. And this will be covered up with a bookshelf eventually and some insulation. So it just means that um, the noisy fan sits outside, and the um, it's all hidden. Uh, so it's the ventilation, the wall, windows. So here we've used UPVC window frames and we've recessed the windows. So it's standard practice overseas to have recessed windows and it's pretty much not done here. It's 99% it's of windows in New Zealand are mounted flush overlapping the cladding. So they're in the cold um, ventilation cavity, um, your cladding cavity on the outside. So there's a lot of thermal bridging happens there. Um, so I'm going to talk about the windows and um, also the floor. Um, so, um, and then just a, a key thing is how all of the systems integrate together and, and work together. So um, it's not good enough just to say have a list of things. I've got double glazed, thermally broken PVC windows, tick that box. Well, how are they installed is a key thing. And it's not good enough just to say, tick the box and say, <coughs> I've got PV solar panels on the roof, but how are you integrating that with the other systems in the building and how are you using that? So one key thing in this building and in the other ones that we do is how we use the energy and store the energy in the building. So I'm going to talk about the details of that. And um, we're only doing heating of the hot water and the um, space while we're generating power and storing it in the thermal mass. So, windows. Now, this is a really good case in point. You know, this is um, some Housing New Zealand um, units in um, Gladham Road, four-lane motorway. Um, that's south-facing, so it's a little bit hard to see with this projector, but the um, glass goes full height, and there's a lot of south-facing. So this is the same design across, across the square from the 10 star homes in Church Square. And these were built probably not that long ago, you know, maybe a year and a half. And um, same thing, full white glass on the south side, there's never going to be any sun coming in those windows. So that's just a heat loss. And um, 
So when you're talking about windows, the first thing is where are the windows and where's the sun? And um, you know, the age-old principle of architecture, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. You'd think it's pretty straightforward, but obviously not. The, we're still building lots of houses like this. And um, you know, that house there, there's plywood in the window, there's mouldy curtains that are tied up, uh, there's rubbish in the front yard, uh, the bins are there, um, weeds, and um, that's a new house. So we call that um, the new slums. And that was opened by John Key, and he raved about how good it was. And it was written up in the press as being the latest and greatest thing. So basically we're building to building code, and um, that's our target. So almost all houses in New Zealand are built to code. And I say the, the code describes the worst house that you're legally allowed to build. And um, that's what um, everybody's aspiring to. That's the target. So it's three stars on the home star scale. Um, this house here, it's probably a high eight or a nine because we haven't done some certain things like the grey water recycling, etc. that we did in the ten star home. But I... Um, I call it the 11 star because we've got better walls and we've got a better thermal envelope and we've done a few things that are basically the next advancement on from the 10 star home. But you can have an energy positive house, a house with no power bill and be an 8 or a 9. You don't need to be a 10 star home. And um, some of the things that you might have to do to get to that you know, last little bit might be not what you want to do or not cost effective, you know, it might be a bit like the tail's wagging the dog a little bit. Um, so, and maybe different people have different priorities too, so you've got to think about what's right for you. You know, for some people they might really want to take the water and recycle it. Um, every house we do, we collect the rainwater. So this house here, we haven't got the tanks here yet, but we are going to be collecting the rainwater uh, because that's cheap and easy to do and it makes complete sense. So, um, yeah, so this house here is my own house, which um, we learnt quite a lot on that because we were the client and we were able to do what, whatever we wanted. And um, there was a lot of innovations in that house, low E glazing. Um, I just chucked this into my, this is my presentation that I used for the Queenstown launch on Wednesday. And um, I just chucked this in there because... Um, Frank Gehry is not wrong, and no more so than in New Zealand, um, because the rest of the world is doing much better than us. So um, he, he's, you know, everybody knows Frank Gehry, right? he's a renowned American architect, so, and that's his famous quote that he came up with. Um, so basically, um, yeah, three stars is what we're aiming for. And Christchurch City Council has tried to implement six as a minimum standard. New Zealand government said, no, you can't do that. So building code is where it's at. And we're possibly about 20 years behind a lot of other countries. And probably 30 years behind if you look at how we're doing windows. Um, so um, Auckland City Council also tried to put six star minimum into their unitary plan. So if you get to six stars, that's um, about 2.2% extra on the bill cost, and your power bill is likely to be about 50% of what it would normally be. So it's kind of the sweet spot. Um, so we've done a project for social housing for Christchurch City Council, and um, we um, First of all, we're asked, I was asked to be an expert sustainability advisor and assess the homes in relation to Homestar scale because I'm a Homestar assessor. So I did that and I worked out that 90% um, of them would be nowhere near Homestar 6 and some of them would, would actually struggle to meet building codes. So this is the new design. There was 35 units in the old design and they're all row houses that um, had party walls that were sort of due north. Uh, very little sun and um, a little bit of sun in the morning but not much because that's the east side was where the garage was blocking the sun a little bit of sun in the evening 
11 meters long, three meters wide, like little caves. So after I told them the bad news on that, they asked me to redesign it. So um, we redesigned that and we increased the yield for the site. So we fitted, it was an infill site, which is good because greenfield subdivisions are not very sustainable. And um, it's quite a difficult task, but we got an extra four dwellings. So we ended up taking it from 35 to 39 houses, um, some of them multi-unit, but all the houses had all day sun and almost every room had all day sun. And <clears throat> that's really the key, designing for the sun and then capturing the heat energy or utilizing it via solar and storing it in the thermal mass of the building. Um, so that one there, we actually used uh, the 10 star home for one of the homes or two of them actually, this is one where we had a big tree, where we, we had a big site, and then there was um, in this block of 10 multi-unit ones. So an energy efficient house can be whatever, like Ingo says, you know, it can be whatever you want it to look like. Um, so there's different sort of looks and design typologies. So this house here is a good example because this is a small compact house. And again, every single room East is here, west is there, it's all north facing. Every single room gets sun. Even upstairs, there's two bedrooms and two bathrooms, they all get sun. So, has anyone been through this house in Church Square? This is the 10 star home. There's two 10 star homes. So, there's a two story one and a single story one. And you're welcome to grab one of these. There's, I think there's more in the drawer, but that's the last one in there. But there's the plans for the house. If you're really interested in, in this house, it's open the first Saturday of every month at 11 a.m. for a guided tour to look through. Um, so I'm probably not going to talk in detail about that. There's 30 innovations in this home that are not done in group home building company homes. And um, some of them actually don't cost any more to do. Some of them are actually cheaper. So the wall framing we did slightly different from this but it's actually cheaper because there's less timber and there's more insulation. And um, that was called the jib fix framing system. So, um, but another example is here, this is a solar wall. So this end wall here faces north, that's black aluminium. So that's used as a solar collector, a thermal solar. So we're basically bringing in warm air through there. So we've got, uh, we can monitor what happens with that. So on a frosty morning, uh, minus zero outside air temperature, we can get 27 degrees pre-warmed air through there, and that's just free. So we need a cavity there anyway for the cladding system in New Zealand. We're just using that cavity for something different to pre-warm the air. And quite often, like today, you know, we, we have a frosty morning, we have sunny winter's days, so that works really, really well. And then, if it's already too warm, then we will um, have a bypass and we'll bring in the air from the south side of the building. That's just all automated. So in these houses, you don't have to think about anything. There's all these systems, they just are automated and working without um, thinking about it and there's no issues with that. So that actually links into our ventilation system. So there's a couple of um, inlets at the top and they ducted through to the heat recovery unit for the ventilation system. Um, I already described the ventilation system didn't I, in here. So um, it's really important. Um, so that house there, we're using the thermal mass of the floor. We've got dark tiles around the edge. Um, similar here, you know, the timber floor is okay. Dark tiles are slightly better, but we're still using the thermal mass of the floor here. And we've got a fully insulated floor. So um, a real key thing is insulating the edge of the floor. So we've insulated under the floor, but also up the edge. And it's actually where most of the heat is lost. So 95%, uh, sorry, 80% of the heat is lost out of the edge of the slab. And until probably about two years ago, um, two or three years ago. Nobody really talked about that in New Zealand and it's not part of the requirement for the code. So um, here's a photo from Maxraft who do an insulated floor 
um, Queenstown based company and they kindly sponsored our launch of the super home movement down there on Wednesday. So I've got to mention their name. So here you can see what's happening here. There's a, this is a place in Wanaka and the ground's frozen and it's thawed uh, against the house. You know, they've got underfloor heating there. It would be, um, you know, that would be a good place to plant the tomatoes, but it would be an even better idea to heat your house rather than to heat the garden. Um, so that's a key thing. And then once we've insulated the floor properly, and we can use that as a heat sink, we put hot water into the floor. And um, we generate the hot water um, by, well, we take the solar power from the roof and we use that to power a hot water heat pump. So in the 10 star house, because it's not very big and, and we've got um, a very well insulated house, thicker walls, European style recessed windows, insulated floor and, and all that stuff, um, we don't need a lot of heat. So, And the temperature of the heating system is probably early 20s. If you're talking about a normal house, it probably have to be like 35, 40 degrees. So just gently heating the floor. And the, I already look at the floor as a battery. So we're storing thermal energy in the floor. So in any house, 70% um, of the energy required is thermal, 30% is electrical. And that's any house. <coughs> so um, the hot water um, and the space heating, that's your thermal energy. What you plug in and your lighting, that's your electrical energy. So um, in this house we've got the same system, so basically we've got a bigger than required hot water cylinder, it's upstairs in here, and that's our heat sink, so we're using that as our battery, that's our first battery. Our floor is our second battery, so the, there's a special um, new type of heat exchanger coil inside the cylinder which circulates a closed circuit of water through the floor, and that's called a schnazzle coil. That doesn't matter, you know, you don't need to remember that. I just like saying schnazzle because it's a good word. <laughs> Hi Tony. Good day. Um, yeah, so um, basically we're using the hot water cylinder as a battery, we're using the um, floor slab as a battery, and then I'm not sure in this house if we're going to have batteries, but in the 10 star house we had batteries, it would be easy to, to connect some batteries. Um, probably they will end up being batteries. Um, so a key thing with that system is how it integrates together and how we're taking existing technologies and making them so they work better together. And there's a daylight sensor, so no heating happens at night. So basically we're using the solar power while the power's being generated, putting it into the storage of the hot water or the building. And um, no heating needs to happen at night because the house is good enough at holding the heat that it's not required. So even early in the morning, it's um, still warm here with no heating going all through the night. Um, so basically that's the secret. And I've told you, now I'm going to have to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the whole idea of the super home movement, sharing the ideas um, and just getting the information out there. That's probably the biggest advancement, um, that how that's working. And. Um, the windows, I haven't really gone into the details. Have I gone into the details of the windows? I'm getting a bit confused because I've done a couple of other talks. I'll talk about the windows. And then, um, yeah. So we did some thermal imaging on that job and it just showed that we weren't, we weren't leaking heat, basically, which was really good. Um, Can you talk about the triple glazing that behind? Yeah, I will. So I've just got to find my, my space here. Um, too, many, too many pictures. Yeah, so the windows are really important. Here we go. So the orientation of the windows and the size of the windows. Um, so here we've got mainly north-facing glass, uh, minimal south-facing glass. Um, the ten-star house we had no south-facing glass. There's never going to be any sun on that side. So you know, <coughs> um, and then recessing the windows is a key thing. So. It's standard practice overseas, and it's it's pretty much pretty much not done here because we follow the New Zealand building code detail. So just before I talk about the what are the windows, um, yeah. So I mean, there's other things to consider other than heat loss too. So in this house here, we've got um, 
we've got high level windows and we've got a nice quality of natural light coming in here. Um, you might have a situation where you've got a site with a nice view and what happens if that view is to the south? Um, so sometimes you've got to be, be clever and be careful about how you design the windows. And um, so here, uh, just while I'm talking about these windows, the, the, the roof looks like it's floating. So we've got this structural panel, which I think we can go talk about that. So um, there's actually a cantilever in both two directions there so that we've got good shading onto the windows. So that's important. So you can have a warm house, we think relatively easily. A lot of the time, it's more difficult to keep the house cool. So while this house was being built in summer, there was a day where it was about 33 degrees-ish. And even with no linings on, and I think there was no front door either, it was 19 degrees inside this house. So it's doing a really good job of keeping cool in summer because we've got a big overhang on the roof and, and um, where we need it. So there's no overhang on the south side, big overhang on the north and the um, west. Here yeah, where we've got a lot of glazing. And um, th we're able to achieve that because we've got this structural panel and have those windows going right to the top and have that sort of seamless look um, there. Um, because we've got some steel above the panel so there's insulation above this panel. So you know what you're, what you're seeing with the finished ceiling is the structure, and then there's a small piece of box section steel, which is the width of this insulation, <laughs> on top of that, just to make that work without having a lintel above the window. So normally you'd have like a lintel there. Um, anyway, um, so just in terms of the thermal performance of the window, um, the key things are first of all recessing it. And um, and then you know what are the windows? Um, so there's a heavily recessed window, European sort of detail. This is the the church square ten star home. That's uh, the first house that we started recessing the windows on, and that's sort of a drawing of it there. But um, the next one's another drawing. So basically, the reason windows aren't recessed in New Zealand, um, and you know there's been research done on this and. I think Brian's researched 300 homes throughout the country and uh, 100 in Auckland, 100 in Hamilton, 100 in Christchurch and 299 of those homes had flush mounted aluminium standard double glazed windows. Not firmly broken, not low E. And, um, so, and they followed this detail here. So this is out of the New Zealand Building Code. So the window is mounted um, overlapping the cladding on the outside. So you'll notice in this house, there's a, they're quite heavily recessed. If you look outside, there's a big timber return. Um, so in this case here, why do we do this? Because the building code tells us to. And people are um, scared of liability for, you know, that leaks, leaky building syndrome. Um, so people don't want to deviate from the standard building code detail. And that is a problem because here, being in this part of the, you've got your aluminium window here, you've got a big chunky piece of aluminium sitting underneath it, which again is a big heat sink or cold sink, as the case may be. And here, there's a channel in this aluminium window at the bottom. Has, has anyone ever noticed there's a channel in the bottom of the aluminium windows? The graveyard for dead flies and for mould together. So that's for the condensation that runs down the window. And um, and if you don't wipe that off, like a lot of people have this ritual of wiping the windows down every morning. Um, but if you don't do that, then the condensation can drain out the holes that they've drilled through that bottom of that aluminium channel. So you can do a nice warm house with better floor, walls, roof, insulation. You've still got holes drilled through aluminium going out to the cold air in 99% um, of New Zealand homes, sadly. So that's not good, so we recess the windows, they're UPVC frames, non-conductive, much better than aluminium, and they're sitting on the structural timber frame. Um, way better idea. But um, other than recessing the windows, in this house they're double glazed. So this little model here shows a recessed triple glazed window. Triple glazing is very expensive in New Zealand. That's standard in Europe. And um, it's actually more expensive for double glazing because they don't do it. 
So here we're not set up to do triple glazing. So um, it's very expensive. Last I had is because uh, we're going to have a certified passport project in close to Rangiora, and the last info we got in regards to those windows is uh, neither maple glass nor meridian doing triple glazing anymore. Yeah, they completely say it's not the market here. So if you do want to have triple glazing, you need to have your own seats. Yeah, not exactly. So you can import triple glazed windows much cheaper than what they're available in New Zealand. But um, um, yeah, so the best we've got here is double glazing, but there's double glazing and there's double glazing. So these are double glazed windows, but they're about four times as good as new, your sort of typical double glazed windows. So um, first of all, the thing is the spacer between the glass. So all of the major glazing companies give you a piece of aluminium there and that is a thermal conductor. So plastic, it's called a thermic spacer or the latest one is called a super spacer. Uh, I like that name. <coughs> and um, PVC frames, I've talked about that. Low E, okay, 30% better performance through using low E and there's three levels of low E. So we chose the best one here, low E, XL. Argon gas, 10% better performance. Um, but it's cheap, so we do it as a matter of course. It's just a gas that's injected into the, the um, double glazing unit. And um, so, in terms of our value, we're around about um, three times as good, but because we're recessing the windows, I think we're about four times as good. So, typical um, aluminium windows 0.26, a, a normal PVC windows 0.53, these are 0.7. Um, but I think they're probably much better than that because we've recessed them. Uh, that's the windows. Any questions? Have I forgotten to talk about anything, Beth? No. You've heard me talk about this three times already. So. Um, so I'm happy to, to answer any questions if, if there are any questions. The PVC framing got over the um, I think that's an urban myth. Um, the material that the windows are made out of doesn't de degrade in New Zealand UV. So um, it's completely different composition to the um, Mali rainwater gutters that get brittle and break from the past. And it's got titanium dioxide in, in there. Um, so it's, it's probably a more similar material to what you see on your car, um, bumpers and mirrors and things. Um, in actual fact, 80% of the windows made overseas are PVC. New Zealand, 95% of the windows are aluminium. Yeah. Yeah. I think they did a long-term study uh, on top of the art in the highest building in Europe, which is a PVC window uh, building as well, and they did a long-term study for 20 years. Um, and they actually consider the UV radiation as well, but nothing has happened to it. And as Bob mentioned, the composition of that kind of PVC is completely different to the gutter 